convergence of sequences of functions is a big deal. In the previous video, we saw our first example of a sequence of functions that converged in one sense, but did not converge in a different sense. So in this video, we want to take a look at that different sense in which the functions did not converge. This was the sense in which we measure the difference between two functions, the distance between two functions, by finding the largest vertical line segment that we can draw in between the two graphs. That's called the uniform distance, or the uniform metric between functions. And so what it was about that example that was a little bit unsettling is that even though all of the members of my sequence were continuous functions, their limit was not a continuous function. It was this step function that jumped up to 1 when x is equal to 1, and it was 0 everywhere else. And so maybe that has something to do with the fact that this sequence of functions is not converging to the 0 function in the uniform metric sense, in the d infinity metric. And in fact, that's what we're going to prove in this video. We're going to show that if I have a sequence of functions, all of who are continuous, and if that sequence converges in this d infinity metric to some limit function, then the limit function that it converges to must be a continuous function as well. So continuity is preserved. If all the members of my sequence are continuous and that sequence converges in this uniform metric sense, then that limiting function is required to also be continuous. We can't break the continuity of a sequence of continuous functions when we pass to their uniform limit. So what does that proof look like? This is a paradigmatic proof in analysis. So it's typical of what a lot of the kinds of reasoning and argument that we're going to do for the rest of the semester is going to look like. So this one is well worth watching and rewatching. So we start with a sequence of functions. Let's call them f sub n. They all have a common domain. We're going to call that domain e. And now let's suppose that my sequence of functions converges in this d infinity metric. Now let's take a quick sidebar here to remember what that means. To converge in the d infinity metric, means that for all epsilon greater than 0, we can find a natural number capital N such that for all natural numbers little n, if little n is greater than or equal to capital N, then the uniform distance from f sub n to f will be less than epsilon. Remember what uniform distance is, how it works. The uniform distance between two functions is the largest line segment, vertical line segment, that I can draw in between their two graphs. It's the supremum of the absolute value of the difference of fn of x and f of x where x ranges over the entirety of the domain. Well, OK, but then this means that if the supremum of all of these distances is less than epsilon, it must mean that all of those distances themselves are less than epsilon. So another way to say this idea of convergence is that for all epsilon greater than 0, we can find a, a natural number, capital N, such that for all natural numbers greater than or equal to n, and for all x's in my domain, we have the difference between f of n of x and f of x is less than epsilon. This is a notion of convergence for functions that is called, perhaps not surprisingly, uniform convergence. Uniform convergence is going to be a big deal, capital B, capital D, when it comes time to talking about sequences and approximating functions. All right, so what is this theorem going to say? If I have a uniformly converging sequence of functions, and if all of my functions are continuous at a point x0, then we want to be able to conclude that the limiting function must also be continuous at the point x0. So in other words, if all of my sequence functions are continuous, then my limiting function is also continuous when that sequence converges in this uniform sense. So how in the world are we going to prove this? Well, let's take a look at what the, what the last line of my proof needs to be, and then we'll use that to back our way into a strategy. I'm trying to prove I'm trying to deduce the continuity of my limiting function f. All right, so I need my last line to be thus f is continuous at x0. So backing that up a step, the definition of continuity should guarantee for me that I can control the distance between f of x and f of x0. I need to be able to control that by bounding it to be less than epsilon. And that that needs to happen whenever the distance between x and x0 is less than delta. Right, so this is what the f continuous at x0 part of my proof is going to look like. But let's take stock. We don't know at the beginning of the proof how to get any sort of estimate, any sort of control on the difference between f of x and f of x naught. We need to show that that's less than epsilon, but we don't know how to do that right away. So I'm going to draw this little diagram that shows I've got f of x, I've got f of x naught. I'm trying to show that they are arbitrarily close together, right? that their distance is less than epsilon, but I don't know how to do that yet. So what I need 
is I need to figure out a way to take a detour along the way from f of x to f of x naught that takes me through perhaps one or more other points that I do know how to control the distance between those points and f of x and f of x naught. I want to replace a distance that I don't know how to control with a sum of some distances that I do know how to control, that I do know how to find a bound from above for. So one such distance would be the distance between f of x naught and fn of x naught, right? So the limiting function evaluated at x naught and one of my sequence functions evaluated at x naught. I know I can control that distance because I know my sequence of functions is converging. Right? And so I know for sure that the distance between any one uh, point at x naught between fn and f is going to get arbitrarily small because my sequence of functions is going to be at least converging pointwise. Right? So I know for sure I can control that distance because of that convergence of fn to f. The same thing is also true at the other point, x rather than x naught, right? Because we have convergence of fn to f, I can control the distance between fn of x and f of x. So I have this orange distance I don't know how to control, and I have these two other distances that I do know that I can control because of that hypothesis of convergence. But I still don't have a complete picture because I don't know yet how to control this distance. Do I know how I can make that arbitrarily small? But then the answer to that is yes, because these are both values of the function f sub n. It's one of my sequence functions. And I happen to have assumed over here that all of my sequence functions are continuous functions. And continuous functions are those whose, dis whose output distances we can control just by controlling the input distances to be small enough. So I can make f sub n of x and f sub n of x naught arbitrarily close together by making x arbitrarily close to x naught because f sub n is assumed to be a continuous function. So I have control over that third, that fourth side of the rectangle because of the continuity of the functions in my sequence. I like drawing these little diagrams over here. This, for me, is everything because it clues me into what the strategy for this proof can be. I can control this distance, f of x to f of x naught, by controlling the distances on the other three sides of this rectangle and then taking that detour around the rectangle by using the addition and subtraction trick inside of this absolute value of a difference. So let's fill in the rest of those details. This distance I'm trying to control can be made to be less than epsilon. If I can take a detour around the other three sides, and if each of my other three sides has a distance that's less than one third of the distance that I'm trying to add up to, right? epsilon over three. So if this distance is less than epsilon over three, and so is this one, and so is this one, then this distance has to be less than or equal to the sum of those three distances. And if each of those three distances is less than a third of epsilon, then their sum is going to be less than epsilon. And that is my whole strategy in one diagram. So all I have to do is fill in the details. How do I get the control that I want? How do I get each of these distances to be less than epsilon over 3? Well, here I have to invoke my definitions. Let's start with the definition of continuity, because I know f sub n is a continuous function. I can make the difference between their output values less than epsilon over 3 by making the input values be within some distance delta by appealing to the definition of continuity. On the other sides, I can make the distances between f of x and fn of x, and then likewise at x naught instead of at x, I can make those distances less than epsilon over 3 by choosing a little n that's sufficiently large that we have gotten epsilon over 3 close to my limiting function in my sequence. So what does the proof ultimately look like? Well, we need to first tell the reader where these magic epsilon over 3s are going to come from. So we have to reference the definitions of uniform convergence as well as of continuity. So since fn converges to f uniformly, because we have this fact over here in the purple box, then that tells me I can make this distance within epsilon over 3, and I can also make this distance <coughs> excuse me, within epsilon over 3 just by choosing a little n that's greater than or equal to capital N, which is sufficiently large. So we'll choose capital N so that if n is less than or greater than or equal to capital N, then for all x in my domain, we have that fn of x minus f of x, an absolute value, is less than epsilon over 3. So that gets me the top and bottom estimates on this rectangle. Then to get the estimate on the right-hand side over here, we'll appeal to the continuity. Since fn is continuous, 
we will choose a delta so that whenever x minus x naught an absolute value is less than delta, then the output values fx, fn of x and fn of x naught in absolute value are less than epsilon over 3 separated. OK, and those are all the elements of the proof to get us set up. We'll let the distance between x and x naught be less than delta so that we get the epsilon over 3 estimate on the right-hand side. We've set n equal to capital N so that both the top and bottom estimates less than epsilon over 3 are going to work. And now we take our detour. This is where the magic happens. We're trying to control the distance between f of x and f of x naught. And to do that, we're going to take a trip around the other three sides of this rectangle using the addition and subtraction trick. So first thing I'll do <coughs> is go from f of x to fn of x by adding and subtracting fn of x. So I'll subtract it, and then I'll add it back. And then I'll go from fn of x to fn of x naught by subtracting and adding it. And then I'll go from fn of x naught to f of x naught. So I've added and subtracted fn of x to get me to this vertex. And then I've added and subtracted fn of x naught to get me to this vertex. And then I've gotten all the way home. And notice I haven't changed anything at all about the value of this expression. I've just added 0 in two different clever ways. And now that I have pluses inside of my absolute value, we can invoke the ordinary triangle inequality. Everywhere that I see a plus, I can break this apart into separate absolute values. So this is less than or equal to the absolute value of the difference of f of x and fn of x, plus the difference between fn of x and fn of x naught, plus the difference between fn of x naught and f of x naught. But then each one of those three absolute values is exactly the distance on one of these other three sides of my rectangle that we explicitly said that we knew how to control up here. So each one of these absolute values is strictly less than epsilon over 3. So when I add them all together, their sum is less than epsilon. Thus, f is continuous at x0. So this is a good proof to go back and rewatch, I think. Uh, because it, it shows how we do reasoning in an analysis sense. We're trying to measure and control the distances between things. And just by measuring and controlling the right kind of distance, the distance here being measured by this d infinity metric, this supremum norm, if you like, that if we can control that distance between the, uh, the, the members of a sequence of functions that are converging in that sense to a limit, then we can guarantee that if all the functions in my sequence were continuous, then the limit function was also continuous. Classic example of a proof, and very typical of the kinds of reasoning and the kinds of arguments that we're going to continue to do for the rest of the semester. As we start talking in the next chapter about the foundations of calculus and derivatives, we're going to do similar types of things for differentiable functions, as we did for continuous functions. And then when we take our final turn into the questions of approximation of functions, it is all this kind of stuff, wall to wall. Um, we can approximate continuous functions by other continuous functions doing something like we just did here. Uh, but we can also approximate, I don't know, differentiable functions by continuous functions. We can approximate smooth functions by continuous functions. All kinds of different stuff that we can do. Um, once we have a little bit more of the calculus underneath our belt to be able to build richer classes of functions along the way.